First up is Chair Hansen with the Supplemental Environmental and Natural Resource Omnibus Bill. Um, so just for informational purpose, Senate File 4062 came to us from the floor yesterday. So we'll need to work from the Senate file. Uh, members, this bill would move separately to line up with the Senate and conference. We have a couple of procedural motions to get the bill before the committee um, in the shape that the author would like to present it. So Chair Hansen, would you like to move Senate file 4062 to be recommended for placement on the general register? Yes, Madam Chair, I would move that Senate file 4062 be recommended for placement on the general register. All right. So let's get the, language, the House language before the committee. Uh, any questions on the Hansen motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Madam Chair. Aye. Madam Chair. Nay. The motion prevails. Okay, Chair Hansen, you ha I also have an author's amendment. Well, I, I believe we have to, I move to uh, delete the language in Senate File 4062 and insert the contents of the House Companion, House File 4492, the first engrossment. Is that correct, Madam Chair? Okay. Are there any questions on the amendment? Seeing no further questions to the A1 amendment, it's before us. All those in favor? Madam Chair? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Conley. You, you are on the motion to delete the Senate language and insert the House language. That is correct. Thank you, Ms. Conley. Um, so I, um, so you moving to delete. Okay, no questions. Um, so let's get that language <laughs> before the body here. Um, any, any questions on that motion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No. 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 The motion prevails. Chair Hansen, you also have the author's amendment. Yes. So why don't we move that? Felt kind of good to delete the Senate language, didn't it? Uh, I move the A1 amendment, uh, and I uh, can describe that. This is the A1 amendment to the Senate file, 4062, as amended. Are there any questions to the amendment? Seeing no further questions, the A1 amendment is before us. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion prevails. Okay. Um, so Senate File 4062, as amended, is now before us. Chair Hansen, please continue with your presentation of your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members, this is the Omnibus uh, Environment Finance Bill. Uh, it has a number of provisions in it. A couple key themes is uh, this bill rights some past wrongs. Some of those wrongs occurred almost uh, two decades ago. Uh, during the Plenty administration when we had to make some cuts to existing programs. And one of those programs was the Metropolitan Landfill Contingency Action Trust, or MLCAT. And about $13 million were taken to balance the budget with a promise to pay it back. And it's never been paid back. And so what this bill does is it pays it back uh, with the interest. Why is that important? There are a number of Metro landfill sites that this fund was set up to handle for cleanup. And without this money going back into the fund, uh, that those funds are not available as these landfills age. And as landfills age, they leak. And so this fund needs to be restored in order to uh, make it whole so that it's available. These are fees that metro area uh, uh, residents have paid into for years. And they haven't been paid back. This bill pays them back. Also in the early 2000s, in 2003 and 2005, there's a lottery and loo tax uh, on uh, sale of lottery tickets. And that was 97% of that was dedicated uh, to go to the environment when it was set up. That was cut to 72% of the lottery and loo tax. And so the rest of that goes into the general fund. So in the tails on this bill, we restore that dedication back to 97% from the 72%. Uh, and then we, it, we don't change how it's allocated. It goes into the same allocations formula, but we increase that pie. So that is where the tails are at about $13 million. Uh, there's a significant in investment in conservation. We put uh, $30 million into the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. 
So often when we think of CREP or the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, we think of an acre amount. But the contract with the federal government is actually a dollar amount. And we can uh, maximize $2 of federal money coming in for every dollar we spend and have that opportunity during the next two years before that contract uh, expires. We provide $10 million for a CRP and state incentive so that uh, landowners who want to participate in CRP have a competitive rental rate uh, compared to the going market rate. We have a whole, a whole article on contaminants uh, with PFAS, and those of us in the legislature have been dealing with PFAS for many years. Um, we have a provisions protecting Minnesota from these harmful forever chemicals, prohibiting PFAS in children's products, cosmetics, ski wax, firefighting foam, cookware, and home and commercial furnishings, requiring disclosure of PFAS on products sold in the state, establishing water quality standards for PFAS, and then with lead, and there is no safe level of lead for people, uh, replacing lead service lines, which are generally found in older homes in lower income communities. We put some money into that. Environmental justice. Uh, Chair Lee has had, for several years, worked on environmental justice involving community in environmental justice and air monitoring equipment. So think of all the money we have spent on monitoring for water quality in the last two or three decades. But we have not had that same equivalent uh, for air quality monitoring. This bill uh, starts that and en enhances it, so we're looking at air quality issues uh, which are, go hand in hand with environmental justice concerns. <clears throat> we have a number of fiscal, agents, uh, fiscal uh, items for the agencies, and I'd like to note that we are not uh, completely aligned with the agencies. We have different priorities than many of the agencies. Uh, we have included some of the agency provisions, but not all of them. Uh, this bill goes, uh, it provides and established a pig's eye landfill task force. Going back to writing past wrongs, uh, right in the center of the city here, we have the pig's eye landfill, right down along the river, and it's a dump. And Battle Creek goes through that, that, uh, that dump. And with changes in climate, we're seeing increased water velocity come out of Battle Creek and increased volume. It's tearing that old dump apart. And where does the water go? Right in the Mississippi River. So uh, we want to establish a task force. And those of you who've been here a while know I'm not that excited about task forces. But this provides a platform uh, for us to hopefully work with and achieve some federal dollars, because this is going to be a large cleanup project. It's going to involve multiple agencies that are going to have to be working together with the community on cleaning up the Pig's Eye Landfill. Um, we provide, uh, I'm going to focus on the little agencies because they often are forgotten. We provide an additional half million dollars to the Conservation Corps of Minnesota and another 250 k in the base to help the work. That's a way to get people involved in the outdoors and outdoor careers. Metropolitan Council, I talked about uh, the lead service lines. We also have inflow infiltration grants and uh, provide for metropolitan parks. Uh, the Minnesota Zoo, we provide some money to continue the groundbreaking butterfly conservation. The Science Museum, who took a real hit during, the, uh, during COVID, uh, we provide a one-time increase of 500000 to help uh, get folks back to the Science Museum. Explore Minnesota Tourism. Wherever you are around the state, uh, there are community events and community activities. We provide $10 million from the general fund to jumpstart tourism. Tourism recovery grants, and then 250K specifically for the Grand Portage Band and for additional administrative capacity. We established a Minnesota Outdoor Recreation Office to help with this continuing outdoor effort. Um, we provide money to the University of Minnesota for a soil health action plan. And there are just a number of additional programs, policies, projects, and important funding here to help right the past wrongs and lay a foundation for the future. I can't end without thanking our awesome committee staff, Janelle Taylor and Bob Elif from House Research, Fiscal Analyst Brad Hagemeyer, Committee Administrator Peter Strohmeyer, Committee Legislative Assistant Scotland Cracker, and Partisan Researchers Molly Peterson and Amy Zipko. We would not be able to do this work without them. And with that, I would stand for questions. Well, thank you, Chair Hansen, um, for that detailed um, presentation.
So there's no other amendments that were pre-filed. Are there any questions? Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Hansen, and thank you for uh, taking efforts with regard to uh, studying the rough fish report. Um, there's more damage, and I shouldn't say more damage, but there's significant damage being done to water quality with regard to rough fish and the turbulence that they do to the bottom of the lake and, and streams in particular. So looking forward to that, um, seeing that improvement. But I was wondering, I didn't uh, see a number, um, and maybe you can put a number to the comment about restoring the allocation of, of lottery proceeds from the 70s to the 97 percentile based on uh, reoccurring lottery sales. Can you put a number on what that might mean? Sure, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hurtas. It's about 13 million. I could have uh, Mr. Hagerman refine the line item if you'd like, but it's ongoing and it, obviously it's going to probably increase as lottery sales will increase, but right now it's about 13 million. Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Representative Hansen, uh, given the fiscal condition of the state, it's time to restore that, so thank you for that. Was there a question in that? I think it was agreement, so I'll, okay. I'll just, I'll be happy with it. <laughs> Even better, okay. Um, are they, represent, uh, Chair Baker fans. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I just wanted to clarify on the, the rough fish provision that we're actually talking about native rough fish um, and not our invasive species. Uh, basically, there's no scientific distinction between a rough fish and a game fish, so kind of uh, in the weeds uh, on uh, talking about fish, but it's a good provision to have in the bill. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Hansen, for the bill. There are some good things in here, and I might be a more unusual Republican sitting at the table. I care a lot about the things that are in here. But there are some things that go a little bit further than even I would take them, and there's some policy changes, and I wanted to know how it relates to the budget. There's, there's a big change in here about permitting people to drive a motorboat, and you didn't mention that. I'm assuming we're gonna have to stand up more infrastructure to be able to permit adults now, because we currently permit under the age of 17, so, or excuse me, under, under the age of 18. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit about what your plan is in this bill to require adults to also have a permit to drive a boat, and what is the cost to set up the infrastructure to do that, because there's some testing involved and so on. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative O'Neill. So that was a Representative Cagle bill, uh, and it's looking at providing training for boater safety. Um, I just picked up some boater safety materials from the DNR for Earth Day this week, and people really enjoyed picking those up. Um, I think the fiscal note on that, I would uh, defer to uh, Mr. Hagermeyer, but um, you know, there, the whole issue with wakes and boater safety and all that, there's a variety of interests, whether they're the lake associations, whether they're the boat manufacturers, uh, whether it's the DNR, but it seemed what everybody could agree on is that there was a need for more training and education. And so providing that boater safety training uh, is something that, can, that people can do to help not only uh, environmentally, but also for that personal watercraft safety. Um, so I don't have that exact number in front of me, but uh, Mr. Hagermeyer may have that in the line item. Mr. Hagermeyer. Madam Chair, Representative Hansen um, and representatives, I just pulled up the fiscal note for that. It's House File 3787 is what it went into that bill. The amount of money requested by the DNR was nothing for this bill. They already do a bunch of it under their current permitting structure. There was a little bit of a, um, a little bit going to the public safety department through their restricted miscellaneous special revenue fund, but that would be statutorily appropriated. So there was no appropriation requested in the fiscal note for the DNR to carry out the functions of post file 3787, which is the provisions you're talking about now. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, that explains why I couldn't find it as a line mm -hmm. item. I was really curious because you're going to be standing up infrastructure for not just all the youth that now have to be licensed, but think about all of the adults that now have to be licensed. And I do see that it's a tiered approach. Uh, I, I do see that. And I think many of us at the table would not meet that tier for quite some time, it looks like. so. Um, Okay. Oh, also, what is the cost for the permit? Chair Hansen, 
Uh, Madam Chair, I do not have that off the top of my head. I think that's going to be rolled into the existing program. Um, I know there are folks from DNR here that could answer that question. Is there someone in the audience who can respond to Representative O'Neill's question around the calls? Mr. Hagemeyer? Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know the exact cost of the permit. A lot of it is done through a vendor that uh, contracts with the state, and it's just their, their cost for, I believe, running the program. I do not know exactly what the permit costs. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the Ways and Means Committee. Please introduce yourself. Good morning, Madam Chair. For the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. This outdoor recreation training program is similar to our training programs we have currently for off-road vehicles, motorcycles, snowmobiles, ATVs. It currently is a voluntary program for children between 12 and 17. It's $25 that goes to the vendor to, to they produce the training uh, program. It's online, also available in paper copy. So those funds go to the vendor and they provide those services. And it's the same as all the other training programs that we operate. Okay, thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So you're saying that right now it's a voluntary program, but isn't this bill changing it so that it's a mandatory um, permit in order to operate a motor or a, a boat? Commissioner Myers. Madam Chairman, Representative, yes. It, it, to provide education, safety, and training, we've, we've seen record numbers of injuries and fatalities these past couple years, and also record numbers of people buying motorized and non-motorized boats. So working with the industry and user groups in the legislature, actually this came from the user groups, Minnesota, the National Marine Manufacturers Association and the Lakes and Rivers Association supporting this pr proposal to provide mandatory education for people using motorized boats rather than voluntary, and also provide an educational effort to help um, children tell their parents how to operate boats correctly. Mm. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, we're learning so much this morning. I didn't realize that we're going from a voluntary program to a mandatory program and including um, quite a few adults. I mean, it's quite a long list of, it's tiered in, but it's by age and, and so on. So, um, and is it still then a $25 permit, but now it's mandatory before you, so, so let's ask it this way. So what would be the recourse? Um, what would the DNR do if they came upon a boater that did not have a permit? after this goes into effect. That was in the correct age category. Commissioner Myers. Madam Chair, Representative, uh, there will be a substantial educational effort to make sure that people are aware of the requirements. And as I've said before, these are required to operate a snowmobile, an ATV, an uh, off-road motorcycle, or to hunt, and, and to hunt on, on state lands. You have to be trained and certified if you're over 12 years old. So it's just an extension of our current programs to help provide safety. And as I said, training is the main thing. Um, to make sure that people are operating these motor boats safely and in correctly, correct methods on the waters of the state. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what the penalty was because I'm sure there is some sort of penalty for not having a permit. I'm, Madam Chair, Representative, the penalty, what I was trying to state is that for several years there will be an educational effort. There will be no penalties involved. Uh, penalties of the game and fish, uh, anything under the game and fish code. Is a, is a misdemeanor to come out to start with. So we would gra gradually increase that. It'll be the same penalty as there would be um, without um, hunting or operating an ATV without safety training as well. Representative O'Neill. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. We got to the end of it. All right, thank you. All right, thank um, you. So I, I apologize, I was gonna ask another question. Oh, you have more, okay, <laughs> Representative O'Neill. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair, I didn't mean to speak over you. Um, so let's move on to the enforcement authority of the DNR, maybe, oh, he already left, um, for appropriating water. And it looks like we're increasing penalties here as well, and I wanted to know the fiscal cost because we're doubling the current administrative penalties from 20,000 to 40,000. Um, it can be forgiven if things are corrected, but it has to do with appropriating water. And I'm wondering if you could tell us, <laughs> you can bring him back, <laughs> tell us what the fiscal cost is, or not cost, but the uh, revenue generated from doubling that administrative penalty from 20000 to 40000 regarding appropriating water. Commissioner Myers. Madam Chair, Representative. Um, the penalty in that bill, it's, a, it's actually an administrative penalty order bill that we worked with Representative Becker Finn on to deal, dealing with large um, issues of, of water misappropriation in the millions of gallons. 
the, the original APO authority that we had was, was crafted around irrigators, farmers who would be appropriating water without permits and things like that. It was a $2,000 forgivable fine. Uh, over the course of the past couple years, dealing with large water appropriations and large projects across the state, uh, we realize we don't have the tools in the toolbox to, to deal with challenges that may come up where people may be misappropriating millions and millions of gallons of water. So we worked with the legislature, uh, the House uh, authors, and Mr. Han Chairman Hansen to, to get this language into the bill to give us the tools we need to enforce when we do have loss of millions and millions of gallons of water. The penalties that are in the bill would, would I would hope, not never have to be used, but it is a tool that we would use against permit uh, holders if they come in violation. And we have the infrastructure in place right now, and it's just increasing the limits of our program that we have. So there is no administrative cost associated with the language. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I understand there's probably no administrative cost, but I was just wondering the revenue generated when you're doubling the penalty. I wonder if there was a fiscal note, Chair Hansen. Madam that is a question. Okay, Commissioner uh, Myers. Madam Chair, Representative, it's, it's hard to estimate what the revenue is going to be off of a violation. We hope to never have to use this language. So you can tell what the penalties are in the bill and the number of days it would take to, to get an issue resolved. But I, I can't forecast into the future the violations of a, of a permittee and what, those gener what the revenue might generate. Madam I Chair. think maybe um, Representative uh, Chair Baker can respond. To this uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. And um, I, maybe maybe explaining it in this way will be helpful for you, uh, Representative O'Neill. Mm -hmm. So part of the idea and the way I explained it in committee is that when there are stricter penalties, similar to with my kids, when I'm very clear about what the what the consequences are going to be, we hope to get better uh, compliance with the law so that by people knowing what those penalties are going to be. And so there is not a fiscal note because hopefully we'll never have to actually leverage one of these against people because hopefully these large permitte permittees will be following the rules. And now that we've got a duty of candor, we've got some other penalties built in, hopefully they're not going to be doing those violations the way that they have in the past. So there is not a fiscal note for the bill. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So increasing penalties reduces bad behavior. Got it. Um, okay, then there's also a section that says civil, penalty, civil penalties are now allowed. Um, penalties as high as 10,000 per day, I'm assuming it's for the same. So if you're violating um, permit conditions, inspection conditions, rules adopted under this chapter, stipulation agreements, or commissioner's orders. Uh, can you tell me what the fiscal note is, the revenue generated from civil penalties up to $10,000 per day? Commissioner or a Myers. person, not an entity. Commissioner Myers. Hypothetical. Madam Chairman, Representative, that's a hypothetical question that I, I don't have an answer for. It would depend on the length of the violation and the number of days that it occurred. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we don't want a fiscal note for that either. Okay. Um, okay, and then it goes on. It can go to the district court. So I guess if they're really bad, then they'll take them and go to court. Okay, we'll just leave that there. Um, so let's talk about PFAS a little bit here. Uh, I understand that these large provisions went through uh, commerce. Um, I used to serve on commerce, and I remember we had many bills relating to that sort of thing. I don't necessarily disagree with the concept, but again, what that does is it makes patchwork across all the different states, which makes it very problematic um, for anybody buying, selling, manufacturing, any of those sorts of things. And we're not just adding one or two categories. You're adding huge categories. In fact, I'm not even sure what you may have left out. Um, and again, I'm not. I'm I'm a person that buys, you know, uh, ceramic and things like that when I'm cooking, and, and I'm very careful and cautious of any kind of chemicals introduced into my life. I appreciate that. But can you just speak to like how many states have this level? of restriction on, on these products? Um, is it one, is it a hundred, you know, is it 10? Like how many other states are like what we're trying to do here in Minnesota and, and how difficult will it be to do interstate commerce because of it? Chair Hanson. Madam Chair and uh, Representative O'Neill, you know, I think it was uh, Louis Brandeis who said that the states are the laboratories for democracy. 
And so one person's patchwork is another person's innovation. And so there are states uh, that are, there's a variety of states that are doing things with PFAS. Uh, they're looking at a menu of things. There's things that states are doing that we may not be doing. Um, last year we did uh, a ban on pack food packaging and we phased that in over time. So I know there are states on that type of thing that have uh, maybe doing a different schedule of phase in as well as different products. So I think what's important here is you have a menu, you have a whole article on PFAS. And so it looks at a variety of projects, ski wax. I would think in Minnesota that we could agree that maybe we shouldn't have PFAS in ski wax. Now, unless there's a PFAS uh, association, a PFAS in ski wax manufacturers board or something that is out there lobbying against uh, taking PFAS out of ski wax, I mean, I would think that'd be something we could agree with. It doesn't seem to be an essential component. Same thing with cosmetics. Do we need PFAS in cosmetics? So what you have in front of you, you know, Minnesota has been a leader in the environment. And there are other states that are being leaders. And as this moves through, you're going to see that I mean, your input is valuable. We'll have that debate as well. And with the Senate, they don't have many of these provisions. But last year, we were able to come to a compromise and actually ban PFAS and food packaging. These forever chemicals are with us forever. And so the best way to deal with them is to prevent them from getting into us and into the environment. So if they're not essential, maybe we shouldn't have them. And we could lead on that. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, thank you, uh, Chair Hansen. I didn't really hear like would even one other state that has, and again, I don't disagree with, I, per I personally purchase products without PFAS and I, I do everything I can to remove chemicals from my, you know, skincare products and my cooking, my clothing, all of these sorts of things. Um, so I, I understand the concept. I'm just, I'm concerned, one, about the infrastructure in Minnesota because uh, you're going to have to do, and the agency is going to have to do testing and, and uh, penalties and things like that to actually enforce it, so the, the enforcement side. So I have, I have two questions. I'm going to come back to if you know other states that are doing this uh, so that we have better interstate commerce, makes it a little bit easier. But more importantly, how, do, how much does it cost to stand up this huge program of now banning all of these substances? Again, I'm not opposed to... Uh, especially a consumer purchasing products that don't have those in them. I completely understand that, but just what's the cost of the infrastructure to stand up all of this? Uh, and then what other states are actually doing this? Sure, yes. Madam Chair, and uh, some states that are leaders in PFAS uh, work, uh, North Carolina has been doing a lot. I, the federal government has co been coordinating there. Uh, the federal EPA uh, director is a past uh, leader in the North Carolina uh, Department of Environmental Quality. So there's been quite a bit of effort in North Carolina. Maryland, um, I believe last year on the food packaging and then on some of these similar types of things has been there. New Hampshire in the past has been active in this. Uh, Michigan, uh, I believe Washington State, all of them have had a variety. Some may not have all these, some may have some different things. Uh, but there's quite a bit of effort going on as well as at the federal government uh, working with manufacturers to try to uh, eliminate this. In terms of the products, uh, we have uh, a phased in implementation date where the agency is there. I believe there are people from the MPCA uh, who could address any potential uh, fiscal consequences with that. Representative yeah. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I would love to hear what the cost is to stand this up because it seems very expansive. You've got carpet, textiles, cookware, cosmetics, juvenile products, uh, ski wax. That's got to cost quite a bit to monitor all of those products. Since we're not doing this across the nation, it makes it much more difficult for the state of Minnesota. Maybe we have some help here. Uh, welcome to the Ways and Means Committee. Can you please introduce yourself and proceed? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and for the record, my name is Tom Johnson, uh, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, we have, uh, uh, Chair Hansen has been kind enough to update the, uh, the costs that, um, uh, that we have estimated for implementing these 
uh, PFAS provisions um, in, in his amendment, in the A1 amendment. So that would represent the cost that we feel um, are representative. Uh, mostly that would involve, uh, in the past, our enforcement of these provisions would uh, include education for um, the manufacturers and retailers. Uh, it would involve um, purchasing some products uh, that, that we think may uh, be not in compliant with these provisions and then uh, testing those products. Um, and then it would include, obviously, uh, the actual, you know, keeping staff on hand to do those activities. So it's the, the but the actual fiscal information is in the A1 amendment. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I have the A1, but just for the public, could you just let us know what that total cost is? and then what the tails cost would be as you're standing up the program. Mr. Uh, Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. Uh, so it, I'm seeing 2024, uh, uh, $598,000. Uh, 2025 and later is $928,000. And then 165,000 may be transferred to the Commissioner of Health because we do um, work with the Department of Health on these matters. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we've got, if I do back of the envelope math, maybe 55 or so employees to begin with and getting close to 100 new employees out in the tails. That's, I mean, that's what those numbers equate to unless you have some other I idea of how many FTEs. I do Mr. not believe Johnson. that's accurate. I can, uh, I do not have the FTEs in front of me right now. If you, I can look, find that information fairly quickly though, however. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, that's all right, thank you. Um, let's move on, thank you for that. Uh, let's move on. Um, I'll ask a couple more questions and I believe my colleague here has got a couple questions as well. Uh, just really quickly, there's also a provision in here that prohibits the importation, manufacture, or, or sale of products containing lead or cadmium. And you have a whole long list in the bill. I won't go into all of those. But there was something that wasn't on the list I found interesting because there's something that we're putting all over the landscape of Minnesota and great numbers that contain both lead and cadmium, um, at, you know, a considerable amount. It's one of the components that make them work. And I'm just wondering if you had any uh, conversation, not necessarily about um, importation or putting it up, but solar panels have got those very, very toxic metals in them. And if they are broken in any way, they leach into the ground underneath. Um, and we've had quite a bit of issue, especially in Wright County, with uh, solar developers coming uh, in great numbers to put solar panels up there. And we've we've had to, as a community, make sure that there's a decommissioning plan, there's a cleanup plan. And I'm just wondering if in this, as you're prohibiting all these other um, items that you've had any conversation about solar panels because those two in particular are very prevalent in solar panels. Oh, he's gonna come back Thank up. You. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and as, as Mr. Johnson's coming up. So the, the provision is an agency uh, initiative there was also a proposal looking at solar panel recycling, uh, and there was, uh, it's not, that is not in the bill because we feel, felt there ne needed to be more work done on that uh, in terms of how do we, uh, it's just gonna take more time figuring out uh, how that would work. So there were discussions about that, uh, but uh, Mr. Johnson can discuss the, the components, why that's in the bill. Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Representative Hanson. Yeah, that's, that is correct. Um, uh, once again, uh, Tom Johnson, Government Relations, MPCA. Uh, the, uh, we had had conversations about this topic uh, with, uh, the, um, with the manufacturers and with uh, legislators. And at the end of the day, we felt that this item, the product stewardship that the governor had proposed uh, in, in his recommendations was not quite ready for, uh, for prime time. So more work is needed, and we appreciate the conversations that have happened this year so far. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, great, so, well, the last time I was at the National Laboratory, uh, National Science Laboratory in Idaho Falls, I don't know if you've been there before, but they are the premier 
developer and researcher in the, in the United States. Um, they're doing all kinds of things. Solar panels that you can roll up like a piece of film, um, hydrogen storage, um, small modular nuclear. But it, when I was there last, which was now just before COVID, I'll be going back again in June. Uh, I asked the director there about recycling solar panels because obviously if we're gonna roll them out, we should have an end of life plan. And I was dismayed that he said, well, we can do it at the bench, but there, it's not commercially viable. That was, I'll give you, that was three years ago and I'll be back in June to find out if there's any progress been made. But they can do it at the bench. There was absolutely, at least that time, there was absolutely no ability to uh, recycle them and pull out these very toxic materials. But my question actually is, since you're there, so again, we're doing a big um, standing up of a new program that would prohibit the manufacture, the sale, and the importation of products, and a very long list of products, mind you, of lead and cadmium. And can you just tell me the cost, the fiscal note of that, and what the, the ensuing penalties might be, so if there's any revenue generated. Uh, I believe Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one second while I pull that up, that information up. Madam Chair, as he's doing that, uh, uh, Representative O'Neill, I. I think we agree on something, that it is easier to prevent than to clean up. And that's why some of these things, you know, whether it's solar panels or PFAS or some of the other contaminants we're talking about in here, having that plan ahead of time, you know, that having a life cycle analysis and having that is important. So, I mean, I think there's an opportunity for consistency here in terms of how do we deal with these contaminants because it is always better to prevent the problem from occurring. We see this all over. We're going to be spending a lot of money in here dealing with PFAS and with microplastics and with a variety of other chemicals and, a, and also some biological contaminants. So prevention is better than cleanup. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just as he's trying to find the, the fiscal cost okay. in, the, in the revenue generated, um, uh, uh, Chair Hanson, I actually, you and I, you'd be surprised how much you and I actually agree on these things. I think where we divert the, the agreement is when we're doing, so really these things should be federal so that it's consistent across the United States. I agree one wholeheartedly. Um, the, the impetus of this bill is fact, we want healthy soil, we want healthy water, uh, we don't want chemicals in our products. I agree wholeheartedly. I'm just debating with you a little bit about the implementation and the fact that if Minnesota does it and North Dakota does not South Dakota does not Iowa does not Wisconsin does it, you know, we're uh, an outlier and it makes it difficult. Um, so that's, that's my concern. I would love to see these things happen at the federal level and not at the you know, patchwork of states. But in any case, you'd be surprised at how much we actually agree. I'm, I'm thinking he may have our number of the stand-up cost uh, and then any revenue generated from penalties. Um, Mr. Johnson, and if not, maybe we can get that later on because we do have a very full agenda. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, and yes, I, I will provide that specific number uh, later uh, to the representative and the committee. But I will just note that this is an existing program. It's, it's uh, amending a, a current lead and cadmium restriction in children's products. Mm -hmm. So that program does exist. There will be less of a, a fiscal impact than uh, in fact, I'm seeing that I don't know that we had a fiscal note on, uh, on lead and cadmium. Oh, so. That's why I didn't see it. <laughs> All right. Is, last question? Uh, so I don't have any more questions, okay. Madam Chair. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, and then we'll have a quick close. Yeah. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I, I'm really glad that this, this topic came up and we're having this discussion. I've had a bill for solar, uh, a solar stewardship panel, um, Program. I've had that bill patterned after the, um, the electronics um, stewardship program for a very long time. I've asked for hearings over the years, never gotten one. The current bill number is 3351, in case you're interested. Um, and I, I think it's really important. These solar panels, the program has been around 
long enough now that a lot of these solar panels have reached the end of their life and we have to figure out what we're going to do with them. I had a gigantic cleanup in my district, as you all know, Peg's Pit, the, um, the infamous Peg's Pit. But um, stuff was dumped there years ago, and it was leaching into the groundwater. And, and this is the kind of stuff that we don't want um, leaching into our groundwater and causing issues um, and con contamination issues. And I. I don't know why, you know, I was super glad to see that the, the governor had something in his, in his um, budget to address this. Because um, I think it's really important. If you're really, truly um, for green energy then, and for the environment, why in the world are we just now talking about this and, and, and the bill that the governor proposed wasn't ready for prime time? Well. I don't know where the agencies and um, folks that are really, this is one of their top topics, have been all these years, but um, we're kind of behind the eight ball in this. And I found it really interesting also that on the ban of things with PFAS is that solar panels are not included there either. The top film layer of solar panels is PFAS, made of PFAS. So I find it really interesting and this is, I guess, more of a comment than a question that, that we're just now getting here with this. Um, and and my, my bill this year, I expanded to include wind energy components as well. I've gone, I've driven down the interstates enough between here and Iowa to see these large piles of, of used wind propellers piled up along the side of the road. It's pretty unsightly. And they're really, they take up a lot of room. Uh, what are we going to do with all these things? I, I, I think it's a legitimate question that needs to be answered. And um, so I'm, I'm sorry to see that, I, I feel like it's negligent that um, in this Democrat bill that solar components weren't included in either one of these lists, whether it's for PFAS or um, the cadmium and the, and the lead. Um, I guess I'll end my comment there, Madam Chair, but um, I, I hope that um, in future years that um, I, I, this, this should be a priority uh, for everyone in this chamber um, and in this body. Thank you. Chair Hansen, any closing comments before we vote? Thank you, Madam Chair. It's, it's always interesting to hear about what's not in the bill, uh, and there are good things in the bill. Um, you know, uh, Representative Scott, I'd encourage, you know, the RFP is open right now for LCCMR, and this would be a great project to do research, and I'd be happy to work with you and, and Ms. Nash to see if we can figure out uh, some proposal for doing the scientific research on that, where it's third-party uh, science. I think the university would probably be a great person, to, a great entity to be working on that. Just on, the, on that particular point, Madam Chair, I know you want to get going, but <laughs> I, I think uh, Representative Scott was nodding on that, that we could mm -hmm. work together on that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Representative Scott. Um, thank you. And, and, uh, Representative Hanson, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at that. I'm not sure that research is needed. We know what's in these components, and we know that they're going to have to be disposed of. So uh, I, I'm guessing there's probably already a body of research out there, but but no, if that's a route to take, that's a route to take. But I don't I don't think we should be delaying this when these these panels are becoming you you know their lifespan has ended, and we have to now dispose of them. We have to know how to do that and and take some precautions right now. But thank you, Madam Chair. All right, uh, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what is in the bill are a number of proposals that deal with past problems. I mentioned MLCAT, uh, I mentioned the lottery in lieu of, I mentioned pig's eye. Uh, those are some legacy issues that need to get resolved. And I'm hopeful that we could find bipartisan support on resolving those past problems. We talked about issues that, are, that we can see. There are things we can't see. We can't see PFAS. We can't see prions. We can't see, uh, I can see my phone's ringing. Uh, we can see, we can't see microplastics, but because we can't see them doesn't mean they're there and doesn't mean they have an impact on us or our environment. So with the surplus that we have, we have a one-time opportunity to deal with these past wrongs and help resolve current problems that are real. 
and prepare a foundation for the future. So I'm asking for your support. I'm asking for your ideas. Um, this is a good bill. Please vote yes. Well, thank you, Chair Hanson. This is a, a one-time opportunity with a surplus. So I just want to thank you for your, your work and your leadership and for the committee's work to protect our state environment and the natural resources. So Chair Hansen renews his motion that Senate File 4062, as amended, be recommended for placement on the general register. Ms. Anna, please take the vote. Chair Moran. Aye. Moran, aye. Vice Chair Olson. Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo, excused. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, no. O'Neill, no. Representative Albright. Albright, no. Albright, no. Representative Becker Finn. Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Bernardi. Bernardi, aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Eklund. Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hassan. Aye. aye. Hassan, aye. Representative Hurtas. Hurtas, no. Hurtas, no. Representative Hornstein. Hornstein, aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Johnson. Johnson, no. Johnson, no. Representative Kreshaw. Kreshaw, no. Kreshaw, no. Representative Liebling. Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly. Lily, aye. Lily, aye. Representative Mariani. Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquardt. Aye. Marquardt, aye. Representative Miller. No. Miller, no. Representative Nash. Nash, no. Nash, no. Representative Nelson. Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor. Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Representative Pulaski. Pulaski, aye. Pulaski, aye. Representative Petersburg. No. Petersburg, no. Representative Pinto. Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Schultz? Aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Scott? No. Scott, no. And Representative Sundin? Sundin, aye. Sundin, aye. Madam Chair, that is 18 ayes and 10 nays. When the vote of 18 ayes and 4 nays, the motion prevails in the Senate. And 10 nays, with there being 18 ayes and 10 nays, the motion prevails in Senate File 4062 as amended is on to the floor.